If you could all please be seated, we're going to get started with the seminar. You can pick up your hurricane passes as you leave when we're done with the seminar. If you don't already have paperwork to do that, if you want to get it and fill it out while we're doing the presentation, that will make it easier for when you want to leave. All right, welcome to the 2013 City of Sanibel Hurricane Seminar. I'm Bill Tomlinson, Sanibel Police Chief, and I just wanted to introduce uh, the new Emergency Management Director who was recently promoted. It's Lieutenant William Dalton, and he's going to run the seminar today. And uh, I guess the most important thing is, is obviously there's a lot of new faces here. And it's important because this is primarily directed towards new residents. Most of the information is repetitive, and we do go through this every year. But it's important for everyone that lives on Sanibel to be aware of these, this information and to know how we function as a city and how our partners work with us so that everyone is as safe as possible. So with that, Lieutenant Dalton. Thanks, Steve. But we'd like to thank everybody for coming this afternoon. Uh, we have a number of guest speakers who are very experienced, very seasoned in the emergency management field who are going to provide some very valuable information for us today. First, we'll have Dave Roberts. He's our city's weather consultant. He'll talk about uh, the formation of hurricanes, dangers of, uh, of the tidal surge, and a few other things, dangers in the hurricane events. Uh, after that, we'll have Gerald Campbell. Gerald is with the Lee County Emergency Operations Center and he's chief of planning for them. He'll speak on a number of issues for the Lee EOC. Deb Quimby will be here. She is a Lee, Lee County Emergency Operations Center employee also. She'll be speaking about the special needs program they have. That's a, a very important program that we're part of. Uh, we, it's something we pay great attention to. We don't want anyone with special needs to be left behind in a, in a hurricane event. After that, we'll have uh, Captain Tim Barrett from the fire department talk about a few of the fire department's roles, uh, search and rescue and so forth. Uh, follow, following Tim will be Harold Law. Harold is our building official. Harold will be talking about some of the building codes and things of that nature that help us mitigate the damages that a hurricane can cause, and all that's done, obviously, prior to, prior to storms. And then I'll finish things up, talk about some of our uh, evacuation issues, and our hurricane hang tag program that, that we're issuing today. And after that, we'll open the, the uh, field up for questions. So without any further delay, Dave, if you're ready. OK. Great button goes right in your All right. How's everyone doing today? Oh, excuse me. This thing's loud. Woo! That's from the movie Police Squad, almost. It's good to see all of you on this quiet Friday. Um, I'm Dave Roberts. I've been the consultant for the city of Sanibel for over 10 years now. We've been through some, uh, some stormy hurricane seasons. We've been through some quiet ones. And I really am grateful that all of you show up. We're all grateful that you show up uh, to this hurricane seminar because in a, in a matter of speaking, you're becoming ambassadors uh, to a lot of your neighbors and a lot of your friends that live here on Sanibel in bringing back a lot of this information because this is where we try to get you prepared. And that's the most important thing is getting prepared for hurricane season because every year we have one. And until further notice, every year we're going to have one uh, from, November, uh, from June 1st to, through November 30th. And in case you don't have a calendar handy, June 1st is tomorrow, so hurricane season is definitely upon us. We're going into hurricane season here, six months out of the year, and just to give you a little primer on how hurricanes form, the key ingredient for hurricanes, of course, warm water. Without warm water, you have nothing to worry about. Well, the bad news, folks, you move to Florida. It's a strip of land that stretches out into water. It's surrounded by water, and the water temperature needs to be 80 degrees or higher to get the development of a hurricane. Now, why 80? It's just a matter of physics. That's just the magic number in which things start to happen. 80 degree water, it breathes, and it creates thunderstorms. You have the moisture at the surface converging. Then you've got spiral thunderstorms that develop around it. And then it really acts as the fuel for a hurricane. 
You've got that solar heat, which is the sunshine hitting the water. It then evaporates, then condensates, then it transfers into the clouds, then it gets released, and then there you go. You have the development of a hurricane. Now, things start out at 80 degrees. That's where we start to be concerned. Oh, by the way, does anyone know what the water temperature is right now surrounding Sanibel? Well, it's more than 81. Yeah, it's more than 80. It's about 85. And it will peak in the low 90s by around Labor Day or sometime into September. I make the same joke every year, so for those of you that are, have come here before, please act like it's new. Um, this is one of the few places I know where you have to get out of the water to cool off in September. And that's just the reality of it. The water gets very warm. And the more you go above 80, the more heat and energy is trapped in that water that can get released and develop into hurricanes and tropical storms. That's why when a lot of storms get close to us, they don't necessarily weaken. They sometimes pick up in intensity because they have all that warm water to draw off of. So that's just something to keep in mind, that warm water is your number one ingredient. You get a cluster of thunderstorms developing, usually not much to worry about. If it holds together for more than 12 hours, guess what? You have a tropical disturbance. If it becomes something better organized, we give it a number in the order in which it occurs. So the next, the newest to the next development will be called number one, tropical depression number one. And then if it becomes a tropical storm, it gets a name, and then we've got the categories of hurricanes should it become a hurricane. Now, let's talk about seasonal forecast accuracy. There's some good news and there's some bad news. This is the part of the hurricane seminar that I sometimes dread because I feel like this is where you've come to see me eat fire or to swallow a sword or to jump through some hoops. And I won't be doing any of that today. Uh, this is where I would love to tell you we're going to have this amount of hurricanes, and this is what you have to watch out for. But I'm going to try to make it specific so you understand exactly what goes into the science of predicting storms. When we're talking about short-term predictions, meaning we're talking about a specific storm or the development of a storm that could hit Sanibel, we are seeing increased accuracy year after year consistently when we're predicting in the five to seven day arena, and even up to 10 days. The long term, six months or better, notice the arrows pointing in the opposite direction. The forecasting for seasonal predictions hasn't been as successful. It's been troublesome because they've changed the equations every year. And I'm just going to tell you that we are now in a season where there seems to be consistency. Every prediction I've looked at is calling for above normal storms in the Atlantic, Caribbean, and the Gulf. Now, what does that mean for you? It means, doesn't mean much for people on Sanibel. It does mean something for you if you, have, if you have a cruise plan this summer or fall. You should take that into account because the forecasts are all there. This here are the tracks and intensity of cyclones um, all over the world from 1851. I may have missed one or two. Can anybody tell me which ones I've missed? No? Okay. Um, but you can see there's a lot of activity um, in our part of the world, and there's also a lot of activity, uh, say, in the Indian Ocean or the, the Western Pacific. But definitely, we are a hot spot for getting hurricane activity. So don't let it be a surprise. That's just the way things work. Here are your names for 2013. These names, they may seem familiar to you because we use the same names every six years. It's a rotating list. So that's the same list of names we used in 2007, as in 2001, 1995. Uh, don't make me do any more math. So you get the idea, every six years. Those are the new names that have been substituted, Dorian and Fernand. The way it started is back about 100 years ago. It started in Australia, a disgruntled meteorologist at the time. Uh, wanted to name a storm, so he named it after a girlfriend that he had just had a very tumultuous relationship with. True story. Next thing you know, we're in World War II, and they're naming all the storms after women. Then comes the feminist movement in the 1960s and 70s, and they said, hey, we, we got to stop blaming women for all these problems. So then they started alternating male and female names. And then we incorporated other countries. So I just want to give you the political correctness of how the naming of hurricanes and different tropical storms has come into play. When a storm is significant, meaning it has caused a, uh, an amount of damage, it goes down in the history books, let's talk about Charlie, Andrew, um, Sandy, it's retired, never to be used again. So when those lists come back up again and those names were in there, other names will be substituted. And that's why we now have French, Spanish, Italian. Anybody remember Georges? One of, the, one of the worst storms. Yeah, it was a, that was a bad storm. I threw away the t-shirt from that one. Yeah. I just couldn't spell it. So 
here's your hurricane season forecast. And again, all the forecasts that are out there are kind of all over the place, but they're all suggesting more than normal. I want to point out what the normal is, and then I'll show you 2012. Normal is about 11 or 12 named storms. Hurricanes, about half that, and about a third of those hurricanes actually become major hurricanes. That's what a typical season looks like for the Gulf, the Caribbean, and the Atlantic. You can see that last year was definitely an above normal year, but not a catastrophic year for Sanibel by any means. So I want to give you some perspective. We here worry about the one storm that can affect here, Sanibel. And when I say that, I want to point out a year 1992. 1992 is one of the quietest hurricane seasons on record. Anybody know what storm hit in 1992? Andrew. So one storm can be a game changer. And that's why we always tell people, you live, on, you live in Florida, you live on an island in Florida, it's important to prepare for that one storm. So just keep that in mind. I went and checked out local history. Okay, I have a lot of free time. So I went and checked out local history to see how often we get hurricanes and tropical storms to hit here, Sanibel. So using Sanibel, the island, and the lighthouse as my reference point, any average hurricane season, we run about a 4% chance of seeing a hurricane coming within a very close distance of this island. 4%. That means about once every 25 years a hurricane hits us. A tropical storm, more along the lines of 17% chance of seeing a tropical storm during the course of any given year here. And then no storms. This is my favorite statistic. No storms, 79% chance of seeing no storms. So now we should just all get up and leave, right? Because we're just going to ignore the, the 21%. How about getting more than one hurricane in one season? Okay, that's, yeah, I don't even want to think about that. That only happens in a very rare, rare circumstances where we get a direct hit twice in the same year. I can only find that about once every um, 100 years. And then tropical storms seem to affect us about once on the average of every six years. Meaning, I can almost tell you we're going to have the threat of a storm just about every year. You have to take that into account. What's going on this year is we have a strong area of high pressure over the Atlantic, we have some very active trade winds, and it is setting us up for probably um, above normal activity uh, across those active trade winds into the Gulf, the Caribbean, and the Atlantic, plus the fact that our water temperatures are running significantly warmer than normal. So you have to take that into account. The other favorite thing we love to talk about is El Nino, which you know, is something we really started talking about 10 years ago. We, we're still figuring out the science to this, but this year is not expected to be an El Nino year. If it were an El Nino year, it's normally a good thing because it means less activity to worry about. The problem is we are looking at the left-hand side of the screen, not the right. And the left-hand side of the screen suggests low wind shear, um, a lot more heat focused over a smaller area. It means it's easier for storms to develop because we're not dealing with an El Nino this year. This is what a typical El Nino looks like. It's very nice. I like looking at this because it just says the activities in the other ocean. Not our problem. It's in the Pacific. But unfortunately, things are reversed going into the season. So we need to take that into account. Living here on Sanibel, we have a lot of concerns. Probably the biggest concern we have is storm surge, because it's one of the biggest misconstrued problems that come from a hurricane. We can tell you with very good certainty how much rain you're going to see from a hurricane. We can tell you with good certainty how much the wind is going to be from a hurricane. But storm surge is a very troublesome issue, because we are facing the Gulf on one side, and we have our flat bay on the other side in the harbor. So how the water gets positioned, how it enters these waterways, is a big concern. Now in Lee County, does anyone know where the worst possible storm surge could take place? I know you do. You're, you're disqualified from answering. Cape Coral? No. Actually, it's Alva. Because the water gets piled up, it has nowhere to go. The good news, that's good news for Sanibel. The bad news for Sanibel is that it's very easy for a two, three, four foot storm surge to sweep over the island of Sanibel. Okay? And a one foot storm surge will knock you on your side. So understand the power of water. Don't underestimate it. What we always try to do when we're, when we're looking at storms is we try to hedge our bet and increase a little bit more than normal. 
what we think storm surge will be. But one of the big misconceptions, for instance, Hurricane Charlie, everybody was concerned about the storm surge. Well, there may have been a storm surge, but that wasn't the problem from Charlie here. It was the wind did a number. There was a storm surge, don't get me wrong, but the wind, you know, so please take it seriously. Any storm you must take seriously. And I'm going to tell you right now, I've seen higher storm surges than Charlie from tropical storms and also from weak hurricanes. Sometimes the ability for them to sit offshore for long periods of time is enough to generate a significant storm surge. And you're not going to be able to navigate or get out from a one, two, three, or four foot storm surge. It's not going to happen. So I know there's always a few heroes in the crowd. There's, um, I've scared off the people that used to ask me this question every year. People used to come to me afterwards and they say, great advice, great information. By the way, what's the highest point on the island? And it's, it's irrelevant, okay? The highest point on the island is um, about 15 miles that way. So just keep that in mind. Now, there are some changes to the categories of hurricanes. Um, there have been some changes to the system. So I wanted to make you aware of those, that the category five was increased a little bit. Uh, they increased category four and category three. And a lot of this has come from, believe it or not, Charlie and the other storms that have been subsequent to Charlie. We're also using new technology. Now, this is old technology. This is the hurricane hunter that flies out of Mississippi. And this is a manned uh, plane that they fly through the storms, but they can only fly it for a certain period of time. This year, we're using new technology. On the right-hand side, we are using a buoy named Emily. This buoy will travel through hurricanes and tropical storms as they develop to give us wave heights, pressures, all kinds of information that we could never have before. And Emily's not scared of the weather, so that's a really good thing. On the left-hand side, you see that? That's a drone. You know, drones are being used for everything, hunting terrorists um, and now hunting hurricanes which is a good thing because the drone can actually fly for upwards of 30 hours without refueling through these storms. So we're now in a position to get all kinds of new information, and it's very important to realize that. Another development that has come from Sandy is the, um, the government's gotten a little heat. Turns out, when the budget was analyzed, they were spending a little too much on global warming. Well, I say a little too much. They were spending far more on global warming research than they were in hurricane research. And after Hurricane Sandy hit, they've changed some rules. So some of the things that have changed, hurricane warnings and tropical storm warnings and hurricane watches and tropical storm watches are going to be issued more often and they're going to have broader definitions so that way people are really alert to what's going on. You may remember with Sandy hitting the Northeast, there were a lot of folks that thought they were just in for a bad rainstorm because it was no longer a hurricane and it was just as devastating of a storm uh, from before. So that's why it's really important that we, have, we identify that. Another change that you're going to see this year is the, um, in the next month, two months actually, they're going to invest $100 million in new computer models to really spruce them up because the European forecast models, which comes from Europe, um, has been a little superior lately in forecasting our own hurricanes. So they have, they've noticed these things and now of course, you know, as we're getting more into a technological age, there's less excuses to be used. So we're, we're really starting to see uh, innovation, we're starting to see a lot of new tools in, um, in determining where hurricanes are going and how strong they're going to be. But the most important thing that I can leave you with from today, we may not have a hurricane this year or next year or for, that, for, for the next 10 years, but we are going to have hurricane season every year from June 1st through November 30th, put it on your calendars, okay? Um, and understand that it's just that one storm and the threat of a storm that we'll probably have to deal with every year. So it's getting prepared, and that's the whole reason for having us here and for having you here today. So I really appreciate your time. If you have any questions, uh, if you would, hold them till the end, and I'll be more than happy to answer anything after we hear from the rest of our speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dave. Uh, next up to speak to us today will be Gerald Campbell. Gerald is the planning chief for the Lee County Emergency Operations Center. The Emergency Operations Center in Lee County is like the big brother to all of us municipalities. So it's important that we have a good relationship with Gerald. And, and over the years, we've developed an, an excellent relationship, and he's here to speak to you today. There you go, Gerald. Thank you, Gerald. No, no.
see if I can do this without yelling like Dave Roberts did. Um, it's kind of a challenge because I'm glad he went first, else we would have all been deaf if I'd gotten up here without warning. And like Dave, most of you, if you've been here before, you've heard my jokes before, so please continue to laugh at them like his. I, I have to laugh at his because I go after him, and I expect him to at, laugh at mine as we go. So, Dave, talk to you a little bit about the weather and where hurricanes come from and what they do and how they get there and how they get names and those sorts of things. What I want to talk to you a little bit today is what can we do about that? Because there's quite a lot we can do to be prepared. We can't stop the hurricanes from coming. We can't even rely on the annual forecast to tell us how many may arrive here. So we have to be prepared every year for at least one. Or if you were here during 2004, we had to be prepared for four at one time. How long had it been before that happened? Uh, about 1960, 40 plus years since Hurricane Donna had come here for a significant storm. And then in 2004, we had four named storms that came very close to us as we went through. In 2004, every county in Florida was declared for a presidential disaster at least once. Ten of us, including Lee County, were declared all four times in 2004. So if you were here then, you had quite a bit of experience. But just a show of hands, how many of you were here in 2004? That's pretty good. That's almost half of the group for those of you with your back there. Surprisingly enough, that's a far larger percentage than I normally get. Right now, when I ask that question to, to the standard general public seminar, about a fourth of them were here during Charlie. So the good news is you've experienced a little bit of a hurricane. If you were here on the island, which you should not have been, you've experienced the wind of a hurricane. But as Dave spoke, there wasn't a lot of storm surge. Why is that important? Because we need to talk about the risk of a hurricane. What's in there? My job is to talk about a plan. When I get ready to write a plan, there are a few things that I need to know, and that's what I'm going to share with you, because I'd like you to believe that planning was really hard and there were only a few of us who were smart enough to do that, and I happen to be one of those really smart people. But the longer I stand up here and talk, the more you'll realize that's not true at all. But what I can do is put together a system that works. I start and I work through my system. So what does that system entail? First, what's out there that can hurt us? What are we planning for? In this case, we're talking about hurricanes. What's in a hurricane that can hurt us? When I ask you what's the first thing that comes into your mind about a hurricane, what's your answer? Wind. See, I heard wind. I heard wind loud. A few people kind of under their breath said water, which is actually is the best answer. But the real answer for most of us is we think about wind. Now, I'm not sure why that is, but I'll offer a bit of a suggestion here and see if it makes sense to you. When the news media starts to cover hurricanes, they start to talk about the wind. Oh, the winds are this much, and it's this big, and it's this far away, and the eye's doing this, and it's wind, wind, wind. And then as it gets a little closer, and it gets a little exciting out on the beach, then people are out there standing in the wind. You know, you've got some person... I will use a politically correct term, in their little yellow slicker suit, arms waving behind them, they look kind of like Superman. It's really dangerous out here. Nobody should be out here. It's really windy. And so we see that picture over and over and over, and we get the idea that a hurricane is all about wind. There are a couple of problems with that idea. First is, that person that you see on TV is not standing in a hurricane. It's very difficult and totally unsafe to be out in 75 mile an hour winds. That person's standing in about 45 mile an hour winds. And they will tell you that, and in your mind, your seeing, feeling, understanding mind, you will hear that. But in your subconscious, you will see that picture and that wind of that hurricane. And in Florida, of course, we can't have a hurricane without the bent palm tree, right? So we see the bent palm trees, and we get the idea that wind is the deal. Well. Yes, wind is important in a hurricane. Wind is important for you here. Wind is important anywhere a hurricane strikes. That's the important part. The good news about that is we can build a house that is strong against the wind. We can build a house with protected windows, protected garage doors, good roof construction tied to the foundation through the walls, and we can build a house that the envelope is strong against the wind. If you've got the money, there's a building mode out there to do that. We just built a new emergency operations center. It is expected to withstand 200 mile an hour winds. <clears throat> the walls are really thick and heavy. The windows are really thick and heavy. And on top of that, they have working metal shutters that go on top of them. And by the way, it costs about four times more per square foot than your house does. 
but we built a place that was strong against the wind. You can do it a little more reasonably for your home. So the wind, despite what we see, is not the biggest issue in the hurricane. A couple of you said water, which is really the right answer. That's what, as an emergency manager, what I worry about. I worry about two kinds of water. One is plain old rainfall. And what happens is people stay in places where they say, we'll ride out the hurricane. It starts to rain really hard in some storms, really wet in some storms. And their homes, their yards, their streets start to flood. And they decide, staying home wasn't such a good idea. I think I'll leave. Well, the problem is, if there's already water threatening your house, think of how much deeper the street is out in front. Usually it's deep enough to float your vehicle. Or the road has washed away and you can't tell that because it's hidden under dark, dirty water. And so what happens, what kills a lot of people in hurricanes, is they drive a vehicle into a flooded road and the road's no longer there and they actually drown in their vehicle or they drown trying to escape their vehicle. For a long time that has been the primary killer of people in hurricanes. With some of the more recent hurricanes, the other kind of water is that storm surge that Dave Roberts talked about. Storm surge is that mass of water that gets pushed ahead of the hurricane that when it washes up on shore creates this huge rushing influx of tide. It's not like the tsunami or if you remember the old Godzilla movies, they showed the dinosaur and there was a crashing wave that comes across them. It's not that. It's like a really rapidly rising high tide that doesn't slow down and doesn't end. It continues to come up 6, 8, 10, 12, 15 feet, depending on the storm, or more. That is the biggest potential taker of lives in a hurricane. And that is the threat that we worry about more on Sanibel than wind or rain is storm surge. When we order evacuations, that is the primary evacuation driver when the county issues evacuation orders. How do you protect yourself against storm surge? If I spoke to you in emergency management speak, I would say evacuate. But what I prefer to tell people is run away. Run away has a visceral meaning to me. When I hear run away, I don't question what that person's talking about. I just run along with them. So the only thing that we can do to protect ourselves against storm surge is run away. So now we know the risk in a hurricane. Wind, rain, storm surge. Tornadoes in there, but I lumped them under wind as well. Just a different kind. Now we know what can hurt us. What can we do about that? We've talked a little bit about what we can do. Build a house that's strong against the wind. Stay put if fresh water comes into your house. If salt water is threatening your home, leave. Run away, evacuate. Where do we go? To a safer area. What's a safer area? Simple. Some place that's not in the evacuation zone. Hotels and motels, friends and neighbors outside of the evacuation zone can be good options. Does that mean if you drive all the way to I-75 from here that you're going to be away from the hurricane? Of course not. You can drive to the East Coast and you're still going to experience the hurricane. Florida's too long and skinny to run away from a storm. Our goal is to get to a safer location away from that storm surge in a strong structure that's strong against the wind and ride it out right there. So now we know a lot about our plan already. We know what can hurt us. We know what can, we can do about that. Only a few other things, and this is where I want to spend the bulk of my time speaking. How do I know when to put that plan into action? How do you know when to run away? It's really pretty simple. If you've been here through a hurricane season, you know that as the hurricane gets closer and closer, the coverage becomes more and more intense. In a few weeks, we'll know every time it rains in Western Africa. Oh, there's a thunderstorm moving off the coast of Western Africa. We better watch out. Three weeks, three months from now, we might have a hurricane from it. Okay, I'm happy with that. As it gets a little closer, there's a hurricane out there. It looks like it could come here. Next news at 6. As it gets closer, next news is in 5 minutes. And as it gets even closer, it's all hurricane all the time. If you turn on your TV and your local weather person leads the news broadcast, it's really kind of important to listen to what they're saying. In southwest Florida, there's only one reason that the weather person is first up. And that's a hurricane. So as we go through, when we see all of this focus on the storm and it looks like it could come here, and if you remember what Dave said, the Hurricane Center is getting better and better at telling us where the storm is going to go. So at a day or two out, if they say it's coming here, it's pretty well coming here. The question is how bad is it going to be when it gets here? That's an important piece that we need to know. But if you're able and you're on an island like Sanibel and the storm is going to come here, there is an almost absolute probability that you will be evacuated. Why not leave a little early? 
traffic's better, you know, Cracker Barrel's not as crowded, you can buy gas a little easier, get a couple days head start on the crowd. So if you can, leave early. But if you have a job that keeps you here, responsibilities, and you can't leave early, your final safe chance to leave is when the county issues evacuation orders for the hurricane. Now notice what I said, that's your final safe chance to leave. That's not the time to start to prepare. That's not the time to put your kit together. That's not the time to run to Publix and throw a few things in a buggy and hope for the best. That's the time to put your kit in your car, yourself in your seat, and go to your safer location that you've already figured out. The last chance. Now, why is it the last chance? People always ask, well, when are you guys going to order an evacuation? The honest answer to that is, I don't know. Every storm is different. But there's a system that we use. We know how long it takes for all of you to get off the island. We know how long it takes to get to a safer location. We look at the onset of tropical storm force winds, not the eye of the hurricane. So there's a time factor in there. Um, we want you to evacuate in the daylight. So we factor that into our decision. If it's a school day or a work day, we want to tell you early in the morning that it's time to evacuate, not wait till 11 o'clock in the morning and say, by the way, we know you're at work and your kids are at school, but you should evacuate now. So we factor that in there. We want you to drive in daylight, get a good head start, keep your family all together, and be able to go to your safer location before the onset of tropical storm force winds. We assign time values to each one of those things. We back those up, and that sets essentially sometimes literally, the drop-dead date for a hurricane evacuation. That's how we make that decision. Then we issue that evacuation order. A lot of folks say, well, why don't you just evacuate us all the time? And there's a couple of reasons. Why don't you just evacuate us every time it does rain in Africa? Wouldn't that be the safest thing to do? Actually, it's not. If we evacuate you more often than needed, you're not going to listen to us at all. Most of you don't listen to us much anyway when we give you really good advice that you've paid a lot of tax dollars to get, you still don't listen. You say, oh, well, I know those guys say it's going to be safe, it's going to be dangerous, and I know that little line is coming straight at us, and they're really good with that little line these days, and I know I don't have any window protection, but you know what? I think I'm okay. I'm good. It probably won't happen to me. It's only those other people that get killed in hurricanes. No sweat. I'm bulletproof. I'm good. I hope so. <laughs> I hope you're lucky and that works out for you. Most of you won't listen, but for those who do, we appreciate that and try to take some of your neighbors with you. But the real reason that we don't evacuate people at the drop of a hat without a lot of thought, evacuations are inconvenient. They're expensive. They cost you money. They cost your business money. They cost your community money. So they're inconvenient and they're expensive. But the final bottom line for me, they're dangerous. I know if I ask 100,000 people in Lee County to evacuate, some of them won't make it back home. If we evacuate nursing homes, they have to evacuate when we issue that order. It's the law. Statistics tell us 3 to 7% of those residents in a nursing home will die just because of the trip. You say, oh, well, they were old anyway. They were going to die pretty soon. Yes, that's probably true. But they weren't going to die today until we ordered them to leave. When emergency management issues that evacuation order, we know that people's lives are going to be changed negatively forever. Bad things are going to happen to people during evacuations. So why in the world would we do that? There's only one, one reason that we will ever do that. It is more dangerous for you to stay than it is to go. It's as simple as that. If you ignore an evacuation order, it's more dangerous to stay than it is to leave. Please just remember, if you forget everything else that you hear today, and most of you probably will, if you're like me, if you remember nothing else, remember, if we issue that evacuation order, your life is at risk if you stay in that evacuation zone. So now we know what's out there that can hurt us, we know what we can do about it, and we know a little bit about when to put our plan into action. There's only one thing that's left. What do we take with us? We hear all the time, make your hurricane kit. Well, what does that look like? I don't know. Everybody's hurricane kit is a little bit different. Here are some things that it should have. It should have 
food that you can open and eat without cooking, so that means a can opener. It should have water, at least a gallon per person per day for three days for drinking, more for that for washing up and sanitary use. Sturdy clothing, not flip-flops and tank tops. You're going to need that if you have to come back to work on your place. Good shoes, long sleeves, sunscreen, bug spray. Here's my personal favorite, a little folding money in your pocket. And if you were to look at this really closely, there's only ones and fives in there, and that's all that I ever carry in that because there's not a lot of change. So some money. If you've got pets, pet supplies. If you've got kids, kids supplies. If you've got medical needs, your medical supplies, your medications, your prescriptions, all your pills and bottles, things that we all seem to rattle around with these days. So everybody, look at what you need. And I finally, I tell people, carry at least a couple of things that are irreplaceable to you. You can't carry the accumulated stuff of 20, 30, 40, 50 years of life. But maybe your wedding album, maybe your child's school books, some of those things, carry those because they may not be here when you get back. The rest of your stuff, get really good insurance and get new stuff when it's over. Protect yourself by running away from the risk. Protect your stuff by buying really good insurance and know what it will cover. Simple as that. Never risk your life for your stuff. You can always get new stuff. So that's it. Know what can hurt us, know what we can do about it, know where we can go, know what we carry with us. I want to talk about one thing because I have just a couple of minutes left. I want to talk about hurricane season 2012 because it was an interesting season. Very busy season for the whole world, very quiet for us. But if you remember back the end of June in last year, we had Tropical Storm Debbie. Now in Lee County, eh, no big deal. It's just a little tropical storm. It's almost 200 miles away from us. Uh, it's kind of big, but we don't get very excited about tropical storms, and we didn't for that one. Were you here for that? Do you remember those couple of days? Windy, rainy, worse weather for most of the county than we had during Charlie or Wilma. I was on the causeway. We thought we were going to have to shut the causeway down. We issued, we didn't issue anything, but I was standing on the causeway with wind blowing under my little yellow slicker suit. <laughs> standing in the waves, with wind blowing rain horizontally into my face. The first time I'd seen horizontal rain since I've been here, and that included the previous two storms. And it was no big deal. No watches, no warnings, no nothing. Pardon my southern. No nothing. When the winds cleared, the rain stopped, and we looked around, we found out that, ah, uh, we almost lost part of Captiva Road, had to run out there real quick and dump some big rocks in the holes so that that wouldn't wash away into the Gulf. The beaches were changed. We had about two and a half feet of surge, not tide, but surge, on top of astronomical high tides. We had water in Fort Myers that flooded up to people's houses, but not in their houses. Make a long story short, for a storm with no warning, no evacuation orders, no activation of the EOC, the county suffered about $2.4 million in damage, enough to require a presidential disaster declaration. We got a presidential de disaster declaration for Tropical Storm Debbie, a storm that we didn't react to at all. Fast forward to the end of the season, Tropical Storm Isaac. Speaking of rain... Um, <laughs> They're, sorry, there were just a few drops of water that hit the ground right there. Um, Tropical Storm Isaac. Watches, warnings, full activation of the EOC, closed schools, closed government, evacuated, open shelters. For what? Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. Oh well, that's the way it goes. Now... Why is that important? Because of the decision making that went into that. We were lucky that Isaac turned. When we closed government, when we closed schools, when we issued evacuation orders, the forecast for our area was five feet of surge and 65 to 80 mile an hour winds over most of Lee County. Takes a while to move everybody. Takes a while to get that decision. Takes a while to open shelters. We waited as long as we could to make that decision. And we missed it, in the words of Maxwell Smart, by that much. Maybe two hours. We lacked two hours of a perfect call. And instead, 
You sit out there and say, what are those clowns up there doing? I was one of those clowns, and I wonder what we did too. But then I go back and look at the forecast, and I plot those things out. And we had no choice. So we're going to be wrong a lot of times. We ask you to bear with us on that. That's another reason we don't issue evacuation orders lightly. And you notice I haven't talked anything at all about my slide in the background because I think it speaks for itself. Those are the hurricane evacuation zones. Anything in red can be inundated with salt water in a, any named storm. We're in the red, in case you're having trouble. Any named storm can inundate those areas in red with salt water. So when we ask you to evacuate, when we look at those type scenarios, that's what we're talking about when we do that. Um, we've got a couple of things here for you. There's a whole lot of stuff available on our website. Um, in the back, there is, you'll find a sheet. It's got a red border around it. It's just a single page. And uh, what it talks about is what happens in that evacuation zone A, what you can expect to see here if a hurricane comes specifically here. But on the back side is a whole lot of information on our website. I didn't talk about our website a lot, and I'm running out of time. Our website has a family plan. Twitter, Facebook accounts, you can follow us, you can get information directly from us, you can sign up for breaking news alerts, you can volunteer with us, we always need volunteers, you can sign up for special needs, which is my way of segueing into Debbie Quimby, who's going to speak to you now about the program, but please take a look at this, we have a hurricane app for your smartphone, so any technology that you use, we can help you with, we, can, we work with that as well. So with that, I will ask you to hold questions as well, and uh, we'll turn this over to Debbie. Actually, I'm going to turn it back over to Bill. Thank you, Gerald. We're going to take just a short break. We have a technology issue. It's going to take a minute or two to, uh, to fix, and then we'll be ready to go. And Deb Quimby will speak to us about special needs issues. You don't need this, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Am I okay to go? Yeah, we're all set. Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Quimby. I work in the Emergency Operations Center. I'm on the planning team, and I also manage the special needs program. Um, we find that a lot of people are not aware of the program. The special needs program is available to all Lee County residents, and we provide shelters and transportation to shelters for people who don't have a safe place to go or don't have a way to get there. To be a part of that, you have to register. We have our applications available on our website uh, for folks that have computers. We'll also get them to you, mail them to you, or you can pick them up. The uh, special needs shelter is for people who would not do well in a regular public shelter. Their health would deteriorate. People who are uh, dependent on oxygen or medical equipment that needs electricity. Uh, folks who are very frail. We have the special needs shelter run by the Department of Health and um, some other volunteers in there. For folks who are a little bit more medically needy, uh, people who are quadriplegic or on a ventilator, we have some spaces in the hospitals for sheltering. For those folks, we have to have a script from their physician stating they need hospital sheltering because of their medical issues. When you fill out the application, you put your medical needs on there. If they don't fit into the little squares on the application, then you can write on the sidelines or attach a note or anything like that. Once you've completed the applications, they come to me. I put them in our system, and shelters are assigned by the medical director. When I get the shelter assignments, I send a letter back to each person and let them know what their shelter assignment is and what they've indicated that their transportation needs are. Some of the things that uh, you would need to know is to, we request that everybody bring a caregiver or a companion to the shelter. We're very short-staffed in the facilities. Uh, for the special needs shelter, we do have folks who are oxygen dependent, and other than that, they take care of their own needs. Those folks don't necessarily have to have anyone with them. For the hospitals, it's a different story. They're very, very firm that you have to have a person with you. When you shelter in the hospital, you're not getting any medical care. It's just for sheltering only. You're in the facility, and you're not going to have any medical attention. 
unless you feel like you need it, then you go down to the emergency room, you register as a patient, and you get the medical care you need. But simply for sheltering, you have to have someone come with you, and you have to have the doctor's script. The things that you would want to bring with you are the things that you need to survive. We're going to provide meals and water, um, and in the special needs shelter, we intend to provide a cot to the folks who are registered. Their companions or caregivers have to bring something to sleep on. You have to bring your change of clothes, your personal hygiene items, your meds, your medical equipment if you use nebulizers or CPAPs, things like that. If you're oxygen dependent, we do provide that. So you'll just bring your portable tanks to get to and from the shelter, and then we will connect you there. But any other equipment that you use regularly, you want to bring that because we're not going to have that at the facility. So once you're registered and you have your letter, you watch, and if we call for an evacuation, we're going to contact each person in the evacuation area and ask if they're coming to the shelter. Just because you're registered doesn't mean you have to come. And if you don't come to the shelter, we don't remove you from the list. I have a lot of folks on the list that have this as their backup plan, and they don't intend to come to the shelters ever because you're much more comfortable going somewhere else, a friend's or a hotel. But if you have no safe place to go, we don't want you to be in a place that's unsafe. So um, bring the things that you need to keep you comfortable. Um, we're going to provide food, but if you are picky or you have a special diet, you have to bring those things. And we suggest you bring a little bit for in between just to get you through. For the transportation, we'll provide transportation to public shelters. And we work with Lee Tran. Um, we're actually working on the transportation plan right now, but we work with them and they will get you to the shelter. If we take you to the public shelter or the special needs shelters, then we'll bring you back home when the event is over with. The, we do ask uh, that folks think about if your home is destroyed and you can't go back to it, what will you do? Just kind of have an idea of what your plan will be because you don't want to be thinking about that for the first time when the storm is over and you think you're going back home. All of our facilities um, are open to, to service animals. Our special needs shelter uh, does not accommodate pets at this time. We are trying to work on that, but we're short about 16,000 shelter spaces. So we're trying to find space for people and you know, in that, hopefully we can eventually accommodate pets, but people who have service animals are welcome in any facility. A service animal is welcome at any time. We do have a pet-friendly shelter at South Fort Myers High School. It's run by Animal Services, and um, they can give you more of the specifics, but basically you bring a carrier for your pet, the leash, the collar, the shot record, food, and cleanup supplies. And you have to shelter at that facility with your pet. You don't drop them off and go somewhere else, um, but you shelter in separate locations in the facility. They can give you a lot more details on that, but if you have pets and you want to go to that, then that would be South Fort Myers High School for that. Um, when the, we are in the five-day forecast cone of a storm, I stop processing applications. I take applications all year long, but when we fall into that cone, I stop processing because we're going to start looking at if we're going to evacuate and who needs to be evacuated. So you want to go ahead and get your, your forms in and just get that done and set it aside. The, the applications that come in during that time, I will process once that storm is over. But um, if you wait to the last minute, you might not get a shelter assignment, in which case you could always go to a public shelter, but you wouldn't be eligible for the special needs shelter. I think I've pretty much covered most everything. Again, uh, the application's on our website. If you have any questions, you can call me or you can um, call the main office number and we'll be happy to answer any questions for you. So if you know someone that it w should you need the special needs shelter or is on some kind of equipment and they could benefit from it, I hope you'll share that with them. Thank you.
Thank you, Deb. Next up for us today will be Captain Tim Barrett from the Sanibel Fire and Rescue District. Uh, Senate, the Sanibel Fire and Res Rescue District is another local uh, agency, the, the fire department here in Sanibel, and we literally work side by side with the fire department in any hurricane event. When we were in the recovery of Charlie, uh, Tim and the command staff from our department were all actually in one location working together. So without any further delay, Tim, could you come on up? Okay, good to see a lot of fam a lot of familiar faces, so you guys have heard some of the stuff before. I'm going to be fairly quick. I'll discuss the fire department's role. Was it because I'm short? What's going on with this thing? Fire department's role in uh, natural disasters. What we're going to do is, is uh, once we're uh, in that five-day forecast, like Debbie said, we're going to meet with the partners, and we do that here at City Hall, and that's everybody involved in the emergency. And the reason, as Lieutenant Dalton said, things went so well during the last ones we've had and during Charlie is everybody worked together. There was no uh, headbutting. There was no uh, problems. Everybody worked together seamlessly, and it worked great. So we're going to meet with those guys uh, probably five days out, and then I think, again, two days and uh, 36 hours, 24 hours, 12 hours away, we all meet to make sure everybody understands what their role is, uh, what everybody else is going to do, and then as soon as the storm passes, we can hit the ground and take off running. Uh, so what we do is our teams on that back table, I've got two of our search and rescue bags, and I've got a map. And what we've done is we've broken the island up into 10 zones. And each crew, there'll be a crew of at least one paramedic and two firefighters, uh, will we'll take the search and rescue team and, and have the map and they will search every single house and business on that map. And to make sure everything's been covered and we haven't missed anybody, uh, there's a checkoff system and the FEMA marking system. Do you guys remember any of the, the stuff from, uh, uh, from any of the major disasters? Katrina, the big X's on the doors, will mark all the places that have been damaged. And um, we break into our groups and then we, uh, we go searching, searching from that point out. And a couple of points that these guys made we need to listen to. The storm surge is one that's a real concern. Uh, what happened, uh, some takeaway points from Charlie, is a lot of folks didn't leave. So when we broke into our search and rescue groups, we did a lot of rescuing from houses of people. And thankfully, nobody was, was severely injured. But it took a lot of our resources just getting people out of their homes. And it took time away from uh, searching for uh, more injured folks. So that's always a concern. If, 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 you get, uh, if the evacuation notice is given, uh, be smart and listen to it, and then get on out. It makes it a lot easier for us that are doing the searching. Um, OK, so the, the takeaway points from the storms that we've been through in the past, uh, leave if you have the opportunity, uh, and, if you, and always have a plan A and B. So if your plan A is to go to uh, somebody's house in East Fort Myers and that's not an option, make sure you have a plan B. Someplace away from the, like Dave said, away from the storm, place of storm center. Um, remember that this is a barrier island. It's that term. We've got a barrier. We'll, uh, when the hurricane comes tearing through us, we'll slow it down before it gets to the city. So remember that we catch a lot of, a lot of the abuse is going to come right across this island if it comes our way. And it's only one way off. So try to get out when you can. Um, the special needs is another one, too. We had several people that had uh, special needs that we had to go get and, and bring oxygen to and get them off the island where, had they registered with our program, they would have known right away and there's a place to go and you, you know, they have vehicles to transport you there and, and get everybody out. And if it's nothing, then it was nothing. But if it turned out to be something, you're stuck on an island uh, with no place to go. Um, I have my notes so I don't miss anything. I think that's about it. Um, the, the big take home is that if you're, if you're asked to leave, uh, take it seriously. I mean, you're telling you that for a reason. And always have a plan in case the first one or the second one didn't work out. Make sure you have a place to go and a place to go in case that one doesn't work out. Um, I think that's about it.
on what else I have. And what we'll do is on the back there, I've got our map that shows one of the zones and all the individual homes and businesses on the zone and uh, our rescue bag and our medical bag and, and look through them and see what kind of stuff we're going to be carrying when we come out searching. And, uh, and I'll be answering tons of questions over here when we get done. All right? All right. Very good. Thank you, Captain Barrett. Uh, next up to speak to us will be Harold Law. Harold is the City of Sanibel building official. Harold, Harold runs the building department. He'll talk to you about the uh, codes, our building codes, and how they mitigate and lessen the effects a storm can have on your home. Thanks, Harold. I know it's already been a long afternoon, so I'll be fairly quick for you. Uh, the first, I'm going to talk on three points. The first one being flood and uh, why it's so important here on Sanibel as they've talked uh, you understand that uh, we have flood potential is only really with storm surge but since Sanibel is a flood zone in itself uh, you have the federal government involved in uh, your insurance for your homes under the FEMA or Federal Emergency Management and their division under that is the National Flood Insurance Policies in which everyone here that has a mortgage is required to get flood insurance from the NFIP. And they have many regulations in which requires communities to enforce, in which we do, and we do it with fervor and uh, a few higher standards, so therefore every citizen here in the uh, city of Sanibel enjoys a 25% discount in your flood insurance. So next time you're paying your flood insurance, thank the city that you have 25% off that. And we hope to continue with that same discount in the future. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is wind. And we've talked about a lot of wind. And we're going to talk a little bit about insurance too. Everybody out here that has a mortgage has to have citizens insurance for wind mitigation. Uh, the city of Sanibel is also uh, very strong in our wind designs and our requirements here on the island. Being a barrier island, our standards are much higher than anywhere inland that there is. So therefore, uh, our homes are built much better than you would see in Fort Myers or wherever. Uh, with that being said, and using the Florida Building Code, our building department has is also ranked along with uh, standards with the other communities in the in the uh, Florida. And you also receive about a 15% discount in your homeowner's insurance because of the city of Sanibel's building department. Therefore, thank you. <laughs> so. When you're coming to get a permit from me and you're doing something, don't be mad at you. I'm helping you save some money. Uh, last year, just in the premiums for your flood insurance, uh, the city saved you over a million dollars in premiums that would have been paid to the federal government. Uh, last thing I would like to talk about is what the building department does after the storm. You've heard that the fire and police come in and do a do a search for uh, injured people and, and uh, people in need after the storm that foolishly stayed on the island. Uh, the building department has organized a group of what we call structural safety inspectors and after the police and fire finished uh, covering the island, we send teams out and we evaluate every structure on the island before you come on. Now, in the evaluation of your structure, we do not go inside, so don't worry, nobody's going in your homes, but we do make a visual inspection 360 degrees around your property to make sure and see what problems you do have. Uh, then we do write up a report. The reports will be uh, computer generated and will be online. As we do them, you will be able to see where we're at and how, we're how you're coming along with the uh, progress of the evaluations of the structures. During Charlie, 
our first time trying this, it took us two and a half days to evaluate all the structures on the island. And after we were finished, then we helped uh, the county some with Captiva and some other areas. And with that being said, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. I'll move the present, uh, this portion of the presentation along a little more also. I know, I know we're getting kind of lengthy today. Uh, there are two things that I'll talk about. One is the evacuations, and secondly is our hurricane hang tag reentry program. That's the tags that are over here on the side. Um, I have to stress that the city uh, doesn't take anything more important than the issuance of that mandatory evacuation order. If we ask the folks or issue the mandatory evacuation order, we really, really implore the people, uh, the citizens, to evacuate. Um, we reference Hurricane Charlie a lot. It was the uh, most devastating storm in recent memory. But Hur Hurricane Charlie was small in size. If it was just an average Category 3 slash Category 4 storm that it, that it was, the average size storm would have pushed a wall of water 17 feet high across Fort Myers Beach, Sanibel, and Captiva. So that would be completely devastating. And if anyone were here, it, you know, there's nothing good that can come from that. There's nothing good about staying in a storm like that. So that's why we strongly, urgently request everybody to leave once the mandatory evacuation order is given because, like Gerald had said, the risk of staying far outweighs the risk of leaving. So, with that said, after uh, an evacuation, when the residents and business owners are trying to get back on the island, in order to expedite that process, we've developed this hurricane um, hang tags. You hang it from your rear view mirror, you, you come in, obviously, it'd be before storm, um, you provide your information. We have the, the, the island broken up into zones also, in 10 zones. Um, when you would be re-entering the island, we would have all the hang tags uh, basically be in one lane, almost like the, uh, the, the, the toll booth is now, and we could expedite um, bringing, bringing everybody back onto the island. If you obtained a hurricane hang tag in 2012, it is still good. We had a considerable amount of the hang tags left over, and the chief he authorized their use in 2013. So if you've already got it, you're all set. And if not, after the presentation today, we'll, we'll, we have plenty of them here for everybody. The residential hang tags are, are orange, commercial ones for the businesses that would be coming back onto the island to help uh, any recovery efforts. They're blue. In order to get one, you have to have one of the following, a uh, Florida driver's license with your Sanibel address on it. If you have a P.O. box, then a couple other things that will uh, suffice. Um, copy of a tax bill, copy of a mortgage deed or a rental agreement, a utility bill, or a voter registration card. Uh, the second portion of why we have the hang tag program is for security of, of the residents. After Hurricane Charlie, we did have people coming onto the island under false pretenses and, and trying to profit from victimizing others in that state of disaster. So this way, we can have a close control on the people who are actually coming back on the island, and we kind of address that problem at the front end rather than the back end. We prevent those who shouldn't be here from coming here, and then we don't have to chase them around, so to speak, while we're in the, in the course of uh, recovery, and, and our efforts can be better spent in the recovery mode. As I had mentioned before, the commercial hang tags are issued uh, help facilitate damage assessment and, and the businesses re returning to the island. Um, for a commercial hang tag, if you're a business based on Sanibel, you need a Sanibel uh, tax receipt. A local contractor needs a Sanibel competency card. A uh, state contractor, they have to file with our law in the building department. Uh, other businesses need a, a Sanibel tax receipt. And all businesses based on Captiva that would have to come through Sanibel, they, they need their Lee County business license. As I mentioned before, our hang tags, they uh, maximize our security while providing only authorized persons access to the property. They, they expedite your return back to Sanibel or Captiva. 
and if warranted, they help us in our phased reentry program. Say if storm hit in the middle of the island is where the most damage is, and we've got all kinds of trucks and, and debris removal going on there, we, we wouldn't let folks who lived on the west end of the island back on because they wouldn't be able to get to where they have to go. So we have it broken down in phases, and depending on where the recovery efforts are, we'll allow certain zones, certain access, and, and so forth as we move through the recovery process. So. If you have residential and commercial property, you can, you can get both. You can fill them out here today, and we can help you with that. And if you want to hang tag sometime other than today, you can always uh, go to the police department and from uh, regular business hours, Monday to Friday, 8 to 4. This is a booklet that we put the hang tag in when we, when we issue it to you. It contains a lot of good, valuable information for uh, hurricanes and, and information from the city. That's how the, if the tag fits in the front cover. We, we uh, encourage, those, encourage folks to keep the hang tag in your glove box so that you have it in your car when you leave, and it'll be in the car when you want to come back. Remember, if you prepare before the storm, including evacuation, you're, you're preparing to live through the storm. At this point in time, I'd like to thank everybody. I know the presentation got a little lengthy, but we did have some valuable information to provide to everyone. Thanks for your attendance, and I'd also like to say at this time, are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. I'll let that specific question be answered by Harold, the building official. As I, we talked before, you, you're working with FEMA requirements for the flood insurance, and you're also talking about citizens' insurance, and they don't always agree with each other. Uh, FEMA requires the flood vents in the lower area to allow the water to come into the lower area so that it doesn't build up pressure and break your walls in. Uh, the garage doors, on the other hand, don't have holes in them, so you have to use the wall vents and flood vents to let the water in. You don't use the garage door. Leave it closed because citizens want you to leave the door closed and they also want it to be an impact resistant door so that air doesn't get in in the windstorm and lift your house. So you're fighting two different things. If the storm surge gets large enough in the perimeter areas, what we call the V zones, where you would have waves, the waves would actually take the walls and the doors out and save your home. Inland, in the island doesn't have a wave action to it. It only has a rising water effect. So therefore, leaving your garage door in down would be the best way to do it. Thanks, Harold. He'll have a microphone for you, ma'am. I would put your garage door down. Yes. Are there any other building related questions while Harold's up here? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I think Gerald's coming up. He could address that. We do have some them sheets in the back. We could address it with you specifically here today, too. So.
there's a lot of information on that map. The easiest way to get a map that's easier to read, go to our website, leeoc.com, and look at the evacuation routes. There's a, there's a header there. It will take you to that map. When it opens in your browser, it will still be small, but you can go ahead and hit your magnifier and magnify it, and then that, that map has additional detail in it. So that's the easiest way to get that. There are larger maps available, but they're not very convenient to use. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. We only issue one per one per per residence. So, yeah, and th that hang tag is only for a brief period of time. When we've shut the island down, and you could you know you could put as many people into the car as you want to come back and evaluate the status of your property. And w once we get a little further along in the recovery efforts, we'll open things up just like it is now. So. If you want to take them both off the island, yes, and you, uh, also remember that's a convenience. Your driver's license will always get you back on the island too. You know, the, the hang tag is a convenience, and, and it helps us expedite getting folks on, and it helps us with the security issue. Because if someone lives somewhere else in Lee County or somewhere else in the state, they wouldn't have a driver's license with a sanable address. So, yes, ma'am. Okay. If you're Hurricane Charlie, the press wasn't permitted on island. They came on they, uh, without permission, and they went to a private resident who gave them permission to be there. So we didn't authorize it. That was an unauthorized breach. Yes, sir. Uh, there's one other thing I'd like to address regarding building. Uh, a lot of times you would, after a disaster, you would just want to get your work done. I encourage you to look at the city's website to find out who the licensed contractors are and utilize someone that is reputable, has a good re you know, reputation, maybe some uh, people, friends you know have used them. Uh, it's important not to use an unlicensed contract because we find that they take advantage of people, especially after disaster, and they do subpar work and sometimes don't do the work at all. So that one of the biggest issues we had after Hurricane Charlie was chasing down people claiming to be contractors who were ripping people off and people who really weren't licensed contractors doing w substandard work. So please use the resources available to find reputable contractors before you go and spend the money and find out that you wasted money instead of getting a reputable contractor to do good work the first time. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Well, in reference to turning the power back on, that would be a function of what damage has occurred. We can't, you know, mandate a certain time frame. It depends on the, the infrastructure itself. Down on the 
for instance, Middle Gulf had a lot of underground utilities which were difficult to find the problem. You'll, you'll find that underground utilities sound like a great idea, but in a, a barrier island where there's saltwater intrusion that may not be the most convenient for replacing. So we can't really give a time frame on when power would come back. It's totally a function of rebuilding the service. And uh, it is one of our primary goals. The, the three goals that the city has after a hurricane or a disaster would be to uh, regain power to the structures, regain water service, and to make sure the structures are safe. And those are the three criteria the city used prior to allowing most people back on Sanibel. So there, obviously there were pockets within the community that didn't get the services, but most, most of the people did have both power and water before we allowed re-entry. Our intent is through phased uh, re-entry. That's why we have the hurricane passes set up that, that are by zone. So in the future, if we have an egress and we have met our criteria of safety, then yes, we plan on doing phased re-entry based on zones. Yes. Thank you very much. Have a good day. And Deb Quimby will speak to us about special needs issues. Oh, you, you don't need this, right? Okay. Thank you. Am I okay to go? Yes. Good afternoon. My name is Debbie Quimby. I work in the Emergency Operations Center. I'm on the planning team and I also manage the special needs program. Um, we find that a lot of people are not aware of the program. The special needs program is available to all Lee County residents and we provide shelters and transportation to shelters for people who don't have a safe place to go or don't have a way to get there. To be a part of that, you have to register. We have our applications available on our website uh, for folks that have computers. We'll also get them to you, mail them to you, or you can pick them up. The uh, special needs shelter is for people who would not do well in a regular public shelter. Their health would deteriorate. People who are uh, dependent on oxygen or medical equipment that needs electricity. Uh, folks who are very frail. We have the special needs shelter run by the Department of Health and um, some other volunteers in there. For folks who are a little bit more medically needy, uh, people who are quadriplegic or on a ventilator, we have some spaces in the hospitals for sheltering. For those folks, we have to have a script from their physician stating they need hospital sheltering because of their medical issues. When you fill out the application, you put your medical needs on there. If they don't fit into the little squares on the application, then you can write on the sidelines or attach a note or anything like that. Once you've completed the applications, they come to me. I put them in our system, and shelters are assigned by the medical director. When I get the shelter assignments, I send a letter back to each person and let them know what their shelter assignment is and what they've indicated that their transportation needs are. Some of the things that uh, you would need to know is to, we request that everybody bring a caregiver or a companion to the shelter. We're very short staffed in the facilities. Uh, for the special needs shelter, we do have folks who are oxygen dependent and other than that, they take care of their own needs. Those folks don't necessarily have to have anyone with them. For the hospitals, it's a different story. They're very, very firm that you have to have a person with you. When you shelter in the hospital, you're not getting any medical care. It's just for sheltering only. You're in the facility and you're not gonna have any medical attention. Unless you feel like you need it, then you go down to the emergency room, you register as a patient, and you get the medical care you need. But simply for sheltering, you have to have someone come with you, and you have to have the doctor's script. 
the things that you would want to bring with you are the things that you need to survive. We're going to provide meals and water um, and in the special needs shelter, we intend to provide a cot to the folks who are registered. Their companions or caregivers have to bring something to sleep on. You have to bring your change of clothes, your personal hygiene items, your meds, your medical equipment if you use nebulizers or CPAPs, things like that. If you're oxygen dependent, we do provide that. So you'll just bring your portable tanks to get to and from the shelter. And then we will connect you there. But any other equipment that you use regularly, you want to bring that because we're not going to have that at the facility. So once you're registered and you have your letter, you watch. And if we call for an evacuation, we're going to contact each person in the evacuation area and ask if they're coming to the shelter. Just because you're registered doesn't mean you have to come. And if you don't come to the shelter, we don't remove you from the list. I have a lot of folks on the list that have this as their backup plan, and they don't intend to come to the shelters ever because you're much more comfortable going somewhere else, a friend's or a hotel. But if you have no safe place to go, we don't want you to be in a place that's unsafe. So um, bring the things that you need to keep you comfortable. Um, we're going to provide food, but if you are picky or you have a special diet, you have to bring those things. And we suggest you bring a little bit for in between just to get you through. For the transportation, we'll provide transportation to public shelters. And we work with Lee Tran. Um, we're actually working on the transportation plan right now, but we work with them and they will get you to the shelter. If we take you to the public shelter or the special needs shelters, then we'll bring you back home when the event is over with. The, we do ask uh, that folks think about if your home is destroyed and you can't go back to it, what will you do? Just kind of have an idea of what your plan will be because you don't want to be thinking about that for the first time when the storm is over and you think you're going back home. All of our facilities um, are open to, special, to service animals. Our special needs shelter uh, does not accommodate pets at this time. We are trying to work on that, but we're short about 16,000 shelter spaces. So we're trying to find space for people and you know, in that, hopefully, we can eventually accommodate pets. But people who have service animals are welcome in any facility. A service animal is welcome any time. We do have a pet-friendly shelter at South Fort Myers High School. It's run by Animal Services, and um, they can give you more of the specifics. But basically, you bring a carrier for your pet the leash, the collar, the shot record, food, and cleanup supplies. And you have to shelter at that facility with your pet. You don't drop them off and go somewhere else. Um, but you shelter in separate locations in the facility. They can give you a lot more details on that. But if you have pets and you want to go to that, then that would be South Fort Myers High School for that. Um, when the, we are in the five-day forecast cone of a storm, I stop processing applications. I take applications all year long. But when we fall into that cone, I stop processing because we're going to start looking at if we're going to evacuate and who needs to be evacuated. So you want to go ahead and get your, your forms in and just get that done and set it aside. The, the applications that come in during that time, I will process once that storm is over. But um, if you wait to the last minute, you might not get a shelter assignment, in which case you could always go to a public shelter, but you wouldn't be eligible for the special needs shelter. Let's see. I think I've pretty much covered most everything. Again, uh, the application's on our website. If you have any questions, you can call me or you can um, call the main office number and we'll be happy to answer any questions for you. So if you know someone that it w should be need the special needs shelter or is on some kind of equipment and they could benefit from it, I hope you'll share that with them. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. Next up for us today will be Captain Tim Barrett from the Sanibel Fire and Rescue District. Uh, Senate, the Sanibel Fire and Res Rescue District is another local uh, agency that 
the fire department here in Sanibel, and we literally work side by side with the fire department in any hurricane event. When we were in the recovery of Charlie, uh, Tim and the command staff from our department were all actually in one location working together. So without any further delay, Tim, could you come on up? Okay. Good to see a lot of them. A lot of familiar faces, so you guys have heard some of the stuff before. I'm going to be fairly quick. I'll discuss the fire department's role. Was it because I'm short? What's going on this thing? Fire department's role in uh, natural disasters. What we're going to do is, is uh, once we're uh, in that five-day forecast, like Debbie said, we're going to meet with the partners, and we do that here at City Hall, and that's everybody involved in the emergency. And the reason, as Lieutenant Dalton said, things went so well during the last ones we've had and during Charlie as everybody worked together. There was no uh, headbutting, there was no uh, problems. Everybody worked together seamlessly and it worked great. So we're going to meet with those guys uh, probably five days out and then I think again two days and uh, 36 hours, 24 hours, 12 hours away we all meet to make sure everybody understands what their role is, uh, what everybody else is going to do, and then as soon as the storm passes, we can hit the ground and take off running. Uh, so what we do is our teams on that back table, I've got two of our search and rescue bags, and I've got a map. And what we've done is we've broken the island up into 10 zones. And each crew, there'll be a crew of at least one paramedic and two firefighters, uh, will we'll take the search and rescue team and, and have the map. And they will search every single house and business on that map. And to make sure everything's been covered and we haven't missed anybody, uh, there's a check-off system and a FEMA marking system. Do you guys remember any of the, the stuff from, uh, uh, from any of the major disasters? Katrina, the big X's on the doors, will mark all the places that have been damaged. And um, we break into our groups and then we, uh, we go searching, searching from that point out. And a couple of points that these guys made we need to listen to. The storm surge is one that's a real concern. Uh, what happened, uh, some takeaway points from Charlie, is a lot of folks didn't leave. So when we broke into our search and rescue groups, we did a lot of rescuing from houses of people. And thankfully, nobody was, was severely injured. But it took a lot of our resources just getting people out of their homes. And it took time away from uh, searching for uh, more injured folks. So that's always a concern. If, 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 you get, uh, if the evacuation notice is given, uh, be smart and listen to it, and then get on out. It makes it a lot easier for us that are doing the searching. Um, okay, so the, the takeaway points from the storms that we've been through in the past. Uh, leave if you have the opportunity. Uh, and, if you, and always have a plan A and B. So if your plan A is to go to... Uh, somebody's house in East Fort Myers and that's not an option, make sure you have a plan B. Some place away from the, like Dave said, away from the storm. A storm center. Um, remember that this is a barrier island. It's that term. We've got a barrier. We'll, uh, when the hurricane comes tearing through us, we'll slow it down before it gets to the city. So remember that we catch a lot of, a lot of the abuse is going to come right across this island if it comes our way. And it's only one way off. So try to get out when you can. Um, the special needs is another one too. We had several people that had uh, special needs that we had to go get and, and bring oxygen to and get them off the island where had they registered with her program, they would have known right away and there's a place to go and you, you know, they have vehicles to transport you there and, and get everybody out. And if it's nothing, then it was nothing. But if it turned out to be something, you're stuck on an island uh, with no place to go. Um, I have my notes so I don't miss anything. I think that's about it. Um, the, the big take home is that if you're, if you're asked to leave, uh, take it seriously. I mean, they're telling you that for a reason. And always have a plan in case the first one or the second one didn't work out. Make sure you have a place to go and a place to go in case that one doesn't work out. Um, I think that's about it. I don't know what else I have. And what we'll do is on the back there, I've got our map which shows one of the zones and all the individual homes and businesses on the zone and uh, our rescue bag and our medical bag. 
and, and look through them and see what kind of stuff we're going to be carrying when we come out searching. And, uh, and I'll be answering tons of questions over here when we get done. All right? All right. Very good. Thank you, Captain Barrett. Uh, next up to speak to us will be Harold Law. Harold is the City of Sanibel Building Official. Harold, Harold runs the Building Department. He'll talk to you about the uh, codes, our building codes, and how they mitigate and lessen the effects a storm can have on your home. Thanks, Harold. I know it's already been a long afternoon, so I'll be fairly quick for you. Uh, the first, I'm going to talk on three points. The first one being flood and uh, why it's so important here on Sanibel. As they've talked, uh, you understand that uh, we have, our flood potential is only really with storm surge. But since Sanibel is a flood zone in itself, uh, you have the federal government involved in uh, your insurance for your homes under the FEMA or Federal Emergency Management and their division under that is the National Flood Insurance Policies in which everyone here that has a mortgage is required to get flood insurance from the NFIP and they have many regulations in which requires communities to enforce and which we do and we do it with fervor and uh, a few higher standards so therefore every citizen here in the uh, city of Sanibel enjoys a 25% discount in your flood insurance so next time you're paying your flood insurance thank the city that you have 25% off that and we hope to continue with that same discount in the future. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is wind and we've talked about a lot of wind. And we're going to talk a little bit about insurance too. Everybody out here that has a mortgage has to have citizens insurance for wind mitigation. Uh, the city of Sanibel is also uh, very strong in our wind designs and our requirements here on the island. Being a barrier island, our standards are much higher than anywhere inland that there is. So therefore, uh, our homes are built much better than you would see in Fort Myers or wherever. Uh, with that being said, and using the Florida Building Code, our building department has is also ranked along with uh, standards with the other communities in the in the uh, Florida. And you also receive about a 15% discount in your homeowner's insurance because of the city of Sanibel's building department. Therefore. Thank you. <laughs> so when you're coming to get a permit from me and you're doing something, don't be mad at you. I'm helping you save some money. Uh, last year, just in the premiums for your flood insurance, uh, the city saved you over a million dollars in premiums that would have been paid to the federal government. Uh, last thing I would like to talk about is what the building department does after the storm. You've heard that the fire and police come in and do a, do a search for uh, injured people and, and uh, people in need after the storm that foolishly stayed on the island. Uh, the building department has organized a group of what we call structural safety inspectors and after the police and fire are finished uh, covering the island, we send teams out and we evaluate every structure on the island before you come on. Now, in the evaluation of your structure, we do not go inside, so don't worry, nobody's going in your homes, but we do make a visual inspection 360 degrees around your property to make sure and see what problems you do have. Uh, then we do write up a report the reports will be uh, computer generated and will be online as we do them. You will be able to see where we're at and how, we're do how you're coming along with the uh, progress of the evaluations of the structures. During Charlie, our first time trying this, it took us two and a half days to evaluate all the structures on the island. And after we were finished, then we helped uh, the county some 
with Captiva and some other areas. And with that being said, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Harold. I'll move the present uh, this portion of the presentation along a little more also. I know, I know we're getting kind of lengthy today. Uh, there are two things that I'll talk about. One is the evacuations, and secondly is our hurricane hang tag reentry program. That's the tags that are over here on the side. Um, I have to stress that the city uh, doesn't take anything more important than the issuance of that mandatory evacuation order. If we ask the folks or issue the mandatory evacuation order, we really, really implore the people, uh, the citizens, to evacuate. Um, we reference Hurricane Charlie a lot. It was the uh, most devastating storm in recent memory. But Hur Hurricane Charlie was small in size. If it was just an average Category 3 slash Category 4 storm that it, that it was, the average size storm would have pushed a wall of water 17 feet high across Fort Myers Beach, Sanibel, and Captiva. So that would be completely devastating. And if anyone were here, it, you know, there's nothing good that can come from that. There's nothing good about staying in a storm like that. So that's why we strongly urgently request everybody to leave once the mandatory evacuation order is given because, like Gerald had said, the risk of staying far outweighs the risk of leaving. So, with that said, after uh, an evacuation, when the residents and business owners are trying to get back on the island, in order to expedite that process, we've developed this hurricane um, hang tags. You hang it from your rear view mirror, you, you come in, obviously, be before storm. Um, you provide your information. We have the, the, the island broken up into zones also, in 10 zones. Um, when you would be re-entering the island, we would have all the hang tags uh, basically be in one lane, almost like the, uh, the, the, the toll booth is now. And we could expedite um, bringing, pe bringing everybody back onto the island. If you obtained a hurricane hang tag in 2012, it is still good. We had a considerable amount of the hang tags left over and the chief, he authorized their use in 2013. So if you've already got it, you're all set. And if not, after the presentation today, we'll, we'll, we have plenty of them here for everybody. The residential hang tags are, are orange, commercial ones for the businesses that would be coming back onto the island to help uh, any recovery efforts, they're blue. In order to get one, you have to have one of the following, a uh, Florida driver's license with your Sanibel address on it. If you have a P.O. box, then a couple other things that will uh, suffice. Um, copy of a tax bill, copy of a mortgage deed or a rental agreement, a utility bill, or a voter registration card. Uh, the second portion of why we have the hang tag program is for security of, of the residents. After Hurricane Charlie, we did have people coming onto the island under false pretenses and, and trying to profit from victimizing others in that state of disaster. So this way we can have a close control on the people who are actually coming back on the island and we kind of address that problem at the front end rather than the back end. We prevent those who shouldn't be here from coming here and then we don't have to chase them around, so to speak, while we're in the, in the course of uh, recovery and, and our efforts can be better better spent in the recovery mode. As I had mentioned before, the commercial hang tags are issued uh, help facilitate damage assessment and, and the businesses re returning to the island. Um, for a commercial hang tag, if you're a business based on Sanibel, you need a Sanibel uh, tax receipt. A local contractor needs a Sanibel competency card. A state contractor they have to file with our law in the building department. Uh, other businesses need a, a Sanibel tax receipt. And all businesses based on Captiva that would have to come through Sanibel, they, they need their Lee County business license. As I mentioned before, our hang tags, they uh, maximize our security while providing only authorized persons access to the property. They, they expedite your return back to Sanibel or Captiva. And 
if warranted, they help us in our phased re-entry program. Say if storm hit in the middle of the island is where the most damage is and we've got all kinds of trucks and, and debris removal going on there, we, we wouldn't let folks who lived on the west end of the island back on because they wouldn't be able to get to where they have to go. So we have it broken down in phases and depending on where the recovery efforts are, we'll allow certain zones, certain access and, and so forth as we move through the recovery process. So. If you have residential and commercial property, you can you can get both. You can fill them out here today and we can help you with that. And if you want to hang tag sometime other than today, you can always uh, go to the police department and from uh, regular business hours, Monday to Friday, 8 to 4. This is a booklet that we put the hang tag in when we, when we issue it to you. It contains a lot of good, valuable information for uh, hurricanes and, and information from the city. That's how the, it, the tag fits in the front cover. We, we uh, encourage, those, encourage folks to keep the hang tag in your glove box so that you have it in your car when you leave, and it'll be in your car when you want to come back. Remember, if you prepare before the storm, including evacuation, you're, you're preparing to live through the storm. At this point in time, I'd like to thank everybody. I know the presentation got a little lengthy, but we did have some valuable information to, to provide to everyone. Thanks for your attendance, and I'd also like to say at this time, are there any questions? Yes, ma'am. I have a question that I wondered each year. Sanibel requires two stories from the open water that will close the storm surge. I'll let that specific question be answered by Harold, the building official. As I, we talked before, you, you're working with FEMA requirements for the flood insurance, and you're also talking about citizens' insurance, and they don't always agree with each other. Uh, FEMA requires the flood vents in the lower area to allow the water to come into the lower area so that it doesn't build up pressure and break your walls in. Uh, the garage doors, on the other hand, don't have holes in them. So you have to use the wall vents and flood vents to let the water in. You don't use the garage door. Leave it closed because citizens want you to leave the door closed and they also want it to be an impact resistant door so that air doesn't get in in the windstorm and lift your house. So you're fighting two different things. If the storm surge gets large enough in the perimeter areas, what we call the V-zones, where you would have waves, the waves would actually take the walls and the doors out and save your home. Inland, in the island, doesn't have a wave action to it. It only has a rising water effect. So therefore, leaving your garage door in down would be the best way to do it. Thanks, Harold. He'll have a microphone for you, ma'am. your garage door down. Yes. Are there any other building related questions while Harold's up here? Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I think Gerald's coming up. He could address that. We do have some them sheets in the back. We could address it with you specifically here today, too. So.
there's a lot of information on that map. The easiest way to get a map that's easier to read, go to our website, leeoc.com, and look at the evacuation routes. There's a, there's a header there. It will take you to that map. When it opens in your browser, it will still be small, but you can go ahead and hit your magnifier and magnify it, and then that, that map has additional detail in it. So that's the easiest way to get that. There are larger maps available, but they're not very convenient to use. Yes, yes sir. Yes, sir. We only issue one per one per per residence. So, yeah, and th that hang tag is only for a brief period of time. When we've shut the island down, you could you know you could put as many people into the car as you want to come back and evaluate the status of your property. And w once we get a little further along in the recovery efforts, we'll open things up just like it is now. So. If you want to take them both off the island, yes, and you, uh, also remember that's a convenience. Your driver's license will always get you back on the island too. You know, the, the hang tag is a convenience and, and it helps us expedite getting folks on and it helps us with the security issue because if someone lived somewhere else in Lee County or somewhere else in the state, they wouldn't have a driver's license with a sanable address. So, yes, ma'am? Okay. If you're Hurricane Charlie, the press wasn't permitted on island. They came on the uh, without permission, and they went to a private resident who gave them permission to be there. So we didn't authorize it. That was an unauthorized breach. Yes, sir. Uh, there's one other thing I'd like to address regarding building. Uh, a lot of times you would, after a disaster, you would just want to get your work done. I encourage you to look at the city's website to find out who the licensed contractors are and utilize someone that is reputable, has a good re you know, reputation, maybe some uh, people, friends you know have used them. Uh, it's important not to use an unlicensed contract because we find that they take advantage of people, especially after disaster, and they do subpar work and sometimes don't do the work at all. So that one of the biggest issues we had after Hurricane Charlie was chasing down people claiming to be contractors who were ripping people off and people who really weren't licensed contractors doing w substandard work. So please use the resources available to find reputable contractors before you go and spend the money and find out that you wasted money instead of getting a reputable contractor to do good work the first time. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Well, in reference to turning the power back on, that would be a function of what damage has occurred. We can't, you know, mandate a certain time frame. It depends on the, the infrastructure itself. Down on the 
for instance, Middle Gulf had a lot of underground utilities which were difficult to find the problem. You'll, you'll find that underground utilities sound like a great idea, but in a, a barrier island where there's saltwater intrusion that may not be the most convenient for replacing. So we can't really give a time frame on when power would come back. It's totally a function of rebuilding the service. And uh, it is one of our primary goals. The, the three goals that the city has after a hurricane or a disaster would be to um, regain power to the structures, regain water service, and to make sure the structures are safe. And those are the three criteria the city used prior to allowing most people back on Sanibel. So there obviously there were pockets within the community that didn't get the services, but most most of the people did have both power and water before we allowed re-entry. Our intent is through phased uh, re-entry. That's why we have the hurricane passes set up that, that are by zone. So in the future, if we have an egress and we have met our criteria of safety, then yes, we plan on doing phased re-entry based on zones. Yes. Thank you very much. Have a good day.